All right, Myers Phil, I like talking about politics and in this video I'd like to uh, comment on an interesting article on how the Conservatives, the party of keeping things as they are, hence Conservatives, has changed itself in a few years from a small state, low taxation party into the party that has introduced the largest tax burden of any government in 70 years with promises to spend big and massively expand the state. And, uh, but first, if you'd like to be notified of daily news and politics, please subscribe to the channel and click the bell notification icon. So uh, the day after the budget, the Daily Express was carrying a, a front page with uh, Rishi Sunak on a mission to cut taxes, it said. Uh, but according to the Office for Budgetary Responsibility, the budget that he has just delivered uh, and that the media was reporting on has just raised taxes higher than any government since the immediate aftermath of the Second World War as a proportion of GDP. There has not been a government in 70 years, Labour or Conservatives, to have created the tax burden that the current Conservatives have now unleashed. There are excuses, of course, and that's fine, I'll get onto the excuses in a moment. But the bottom line is that excuses aside, the current government has just raised taxes higher than any government for 70 years of any party. So a headline that boasts of tax cuts is objectively deceptive. There are only about 21 MPs out of 650 who were even born the last time there was a higher tax burden. As for the excuse of uh, COVID, you see, COVID. Well, there's a few things to say here. First of all, the UK has suffered more economically from the pandemic than any other advanced economy. As such, it's not down to purely COVID because everyone else had that as well. The economic impact would have been less if our performance was better. So if the excuse for the high taxes is COVID, then they are having to accept some responsibility. Second, we wasted billions on nothing. Dodgy PPE contracts were a big one. You know, sometimes we got what we asked for, but it was way above market price. Therefore, a load of money was just wasted. Sometimes we didn't even get what we ordered, but the Tory friend or donor still got to pocket the money. We just didn't get the goods. There was also the tens of billions wasted on test and trace that has, has now been accepted, did not meet its objectives. £37 billion budgets didn't actually do what it aims to do. So given that we wasted goodness knows how many billions when it's all totted up, even the COVID excuse starts to run thin. You do not get to actually waste billions and billions of pounds and then complain that we're in a financially tough spot. You know, the real reason for our financial woes is Tory waste. Finally, if COVID is the reason for this historically high tax burden, when it is valued as a hit to our GDP of 2%, what on earth are we going to have to do to pay for Brexit, which is valued as a hit of 4%, and that's long term. But there we are. The real question is, how did we get into this position that we are in now? As I was growing up, it's quite easy. Labour and the Conservatives, it was very, very easy to sort of get a handle on what each one was. Very easy choice to understand. Labour were about raising the taxes needed to pay for much needed public services. Redistribution of wealth meant that those who could afford it the most paid the larger share. The Conservatives were about a small state and low tax burden. They were the party you voted for if you were on top in life in the UK. You know, if you were more vulnerable, you steered clear of them like the plague. You know, they privatised as many public services as they could. And for the ones they couldn't, like the NHS, they underfunded them in order to later on claim that they've failed and justify privatising it, you know, in the future. Now we have a government that wants to spend big and is prepared to tax high to do it. The media are even going along with this by lying about the tax burden may be made easier for their billionaire owners to swallow because that high tax burden has not been placed on the rich. It's not like they've taken Labour's ground, they're taxing the poor still, they're raising the tax burden on the poor, not the rich. And I was reading an article, I'll link it down below, it's an interesting article in many ways. I do disagree with some of the things it claims, like this idea that the Conservatives used to be the party of business and aren't anymore. Well, they're certainly not the party of business now, no one can argue for that. 
I would argue they were never the party of business. Uh, businesses thrive when the economy thrives. You know, a business thrives when there's lots of customers wanting their goods or services. And it has been shown time and time again that Labour governments grow the economy more than Conservative governments. You might pay higher taxes under Labour. I say might, it's not always the case. But you will get more business. Your workers will also be fitter, healthier and better trained. So you will have a stronger workforce as well, making you more competitive on the international scene. It's really that simple. Not that it is simple for many people who focus only on the tax burden. So the Conservatives are not the party of business and never were. They are the party of bad business. They support low taxation, but also low funding for public services. Then businesses complain that their workforce keeps being off sick and doesn't have the skills that they need. They support deregulation and then complain that workers are getting pissed off at losing the occasional digit at work all the time. But what the article gets absolutely right is that the Conservatives made a leap for a support base that was not traditionally theirs and abandoned an existing one to do so. Because let us face facts, Brexit was won by conning a group of voters who would traditionally not be in favour of the Conservatives. It convinced them that their lives were blighted, not by almost endless Conservative governments, but by the EU. And it worked. They voted Brexit and then voted Tory. Five years of austerity to, to ruin their lives and then they voted for Brexit. Johnson was promising all of the shiny things that Brexit promised, plus massive infrastructure spending. People in these communities don't care if taxes go up as long as they get the benefits in better public services, regeneration of their local economies and so on. In order to keep the support of these people, the Conservatives have to deliver something. Simply leaving the EU isn't enough if the promised benefits don't materialise. The people of large parts of, say, the north of England may have fallen for the calm, but they are practical enough to not fall for promises of benefits in 20 years' time. They want something sooner. Johnson promised big spending and they want to see it. The problem is that this works against the Tories' traditional voter base. They live, tend to live anyway in the affluent parts of the south of England. They don't like higher taxes because they manage well enough in the low taxation model. They especially don't want to pay higher taxes so that Johnson can invest in the north. It's not even like Brexit is enough to keep them on side. Farming communities have been shafted by Brexit. Kent has lost a lot of green spaces to the lorry parks and now the county smells of stale urine. The higher educated, more affluent voters know that Brexit is also harming the economy very badly, which is also harming their business. The Conservatives are trapped between two mutually exclusive models. High tax and spend to keep the working class voters of the north of England, but to keep their traditional support, they need low tax and spend, but also better trading arrangements with our European neighbours. Now, this isn't an impossible situation. It's not as impossible a position for the Conservatives as it sounds. It sounds mutually exclusive. And if they were to try and deliver both of those things, it absolutely would be. It does mean that they have to deceive at least one of those groups of supporters, if not both. And the Conservatives have two massive advantages. The first is the media. You know, that Daily Mail Express front page is an absolute classic of the sort of help that they have that Labour never would in government. The Conservatives have massively raised taxes, but the papers claim that they're cutting taxes. You see the same throughout the Tory press, and even the BBC is playing along a little. And then when they do cut taxes back a little, it won't be reported in the media, actually, if you look at the net effects, the taxes are still way higher than when they took power. It will be, hey, they've cut taxes, lads, back onto the road to glory. You know, they could just ta cut the taxes just a little bit before the election, potentially hoping to convince traditional supporters that it was just a short-term tax hike to invest. But things are sorted, back to normal now, vote for us, it's all fine now, we've dealt with it. Two weeks after their election triumph, there'll be a new budget where the taxes go back up. Oh, sorry, you thought we were going to keep the taxes lower? No, 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 no. That was just for two weeks, lads. You know, meanwhile, they don't even really need to spend that money on levelling up in the north of England either. They just get the media to trumpet a few small, inconsequential projects. Just look at this. Look at the thing we've done. Take photos few small little projects that don't cost very much, make everyone think the good times are coming. If you're not benefiting from one of these projects, don't worry, you're in the queue, it'll be coming soon. Just vote for us in the next year or two, it'll be coming your way, because that's what they do. They can never stand on their record. 
because their record stinks. They always promise good things, they're just around the corner. Green shoots was the phrase that's been used for like 10 years now. They've been plugging green shoots for a long time. Then there's the second advantage the Conservatives have. Even when they can't persuade their voters and the, the media can't persuade those people that things have been well managed by them, and often they can't because they've been that badly managed, they persuade them that as bad as it is, it would somehow be worse under a different government. Any form of democracy, especially first past the post, is all about choices. Most voters don't vote for what they want because what they want is not an offer. So they vote for what they least oppose. Unfortunately, too many people are convinced that Labour would be worse. This is especially the case in the south of England. Labour has been improving its share of the vote amongst uh, some of the voters there, even as it's been losing its share amongst the working classes as Boris Johnson's populism starts to work. But there will be some who will see that things are bad under the Tories and they'll absolutely hate Boris Johnson for it and they'll hate Brexit for it. But they'll allow themselves to think that it would be worse under Labour. These will be Remainers or what might be now Rejoiners that will still vote Conservative. They'll still vote for the hard Brexit because they think that Labour will be worse. You know, that seems to be Johnson's calculation. It's easier to con his own supporters in the South than his borrowed supporters in the North. Because if he lets the North down or he doesn't manage to convince them, they can easily switch back to Labour because it's only been a quick switch this anyway. They're not... They've not been voting Labour, uh, sorry, Conservatives all their lives. So it's very easy for them to go, well, he promised us these things, they lied. It doesn't hurt their ego to go, we're going to switch back. Bit different in the South. So although he wants to try and con both camps into believing his nonsense, he'll put more substance be behind uh, the North. Or, or I use that sort of to generalise. I'm talking about the, the parts of the country that wouldn't traditionally vote Conservative and have been sort of left behind largely in the north of England, there are other areas as well. And he'll put more of his con behind the traditional voter base and less substance there. You know, because he obviously feels he stands to gain more from populism amongst those poorer voters than he stands to gain from the traditional voters. Because he can't win a many of those back because of Brexit. Because if he loses the so-called red wall, it's curtains for the government. He can afford to lose some of the blue wall because the chances are he won't lose as much of that as Labour lost in their heartlands. For the reason I've just said, there'll be a lot of traditional Conservative voters who will still vote Conservative. But those are my thoughts. Let me know yours in the comments below. I hope you found the video interesting. If you do, don't forget to click the like button. If you'd like to support the channel further, please also click the Patreon link for details. And until next time, I'll see you later.